700 million minds are being replaced by this red book. The thoughts of Chairman Mao Zedong. On October 1, 1949, in Tiananmen Square, Mao Zedong declared the establishment of the People's Republic of China. No American journalists were there to cover the event. With the communist victory, the American press corps had been forced to leave China. The British colony of Hong Kong became the primary base for those who continued to follow the country. Among them, Roy Rowan of Life magazine. We set up office in the Peninsula Hotel in the bridal suite. 300 bucks a month, and we did the best we could. John Roderick of the Associated Press, who, like Rowan, had spent the past several years in China, ended up in Hong Kong as well. There in Hong Kong was a kind of curious breed of reporter called the China Watchers. Our job was to report on China from outside of China, in this case, Hong Kong. It was very frustrating being a China Watcher because, one, you're relying on other people's reporting. And I had to do a lot of writing of, uh, of stories based on on this uh, on all this secondary material, but I, I didn't find it very satisfying. Soon after, in June 1950, the Korean War broke out. By the end of that year, the Chinese, who had intervened to prop up their North Korean allies against U.S. and U.N. forces, were engaged in bloody combat with American troops. John Rich, who'd worked for the International News Service in China before the 1949 revolution, covered the Korean War for NBC News. This is John Rich with an artillery battery north of Suwon, Korea. Battery! Oh! Like many reporters, the experience profoundly influenced his attitude towards China. Big effect, because they were the enemy there. They were chasing us down the Korean Peninsula, so <laughs> rather a hostile attitude. Murray Fromson, who later became a correspondent in Asia for CBS, covered the Korean conflict for the U.S. military paper Stars and Stripes. American journalists bought into the Cold War psychology, and I don't deny I was one of those, like everybody else. We, we, we looked at China through the Cold War eyes. In the United States, the 50s was the era of McCarthyism, a witch hunt for suspected communist sympathizers, including those who allegedly had been responsible for the U.S. losing China to the communists. Seymour Topping had covered the Chinese Civil War for the Associated Press. I thought it was absolutely unbelievable that that there was such a, such a debate. It was Chiang Kai-shek, essentially, and the Kuomintang Party that lost, uh, lost China. But nevertheless, it was exploited by uh, uh, McCarthy. Rutherford Potts had covered both the final months of the nationalist regime in China and much of the Korean War for United Press International. The McCarthy era certainly influenced all media in the sense that no one wanted to be accused by that right-wing fringe or by editors. As a journalist, as a press agency reporter, I had to feel that I had to show appreciation of the evil of China and of communism. A number of veteran China reporters suffered during the McCarthy era. Some lost their jobs, others faced legal action. Washington's hostility to the Chinese communist regime was symbolized by the refusal of President Eisenhower's Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, to shake the hand of Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai at a conference in Geneva in 1954. A year later, that attitude torpedoed a Chinese overture to the U.S. press made by Zhou himself. Zhou Enlai then announced that American correspondents could return to Peking. I mean, great joy and excitement in the press corps all over the world in, the, in America. And uh, we made plans to, uh, to go back to China. In fact, AP named me, uh, Frank Stasel, named me chief of bureau in Peking. And then John Foster Dulles intruded. He said, on no circumstances will you go to Peking. 
Will any of you go to PK? If you do, $10,000 fine, five years in jail. That damped everybody. At that time, many reporters, including Theodore White, who covered China in the 40s for Time magazine, were sharply critical. I think there's a fundamental folly, or worse than that, in the State Department's policy. In a way, they've accepted the underlying philosophy of the communists, that newspaper men are pawns or tools of government policy. I traveled over 7,000 miles in this land which is larger than either the United States or Canada. A very few reporters, however, defied the ban. Among them was Robert Cohen, a freelance filmmaker. On a trip with a group of students to the Soviet Union in 1957, he and several of his traveling companions were given visas to visit China. The mass media presentation of China is, it's uh, the evil empire, it's Fu Manchu, it's worse than Fu Manchu. You can't understand them. They're incomprehensible, inscrutable Orientals. Cohen had been given a camera by NBC News and did a handful of short pieces, seeking to portray a country struggling to rebuild after years of war and revolution. Basically what I'm showing is a travelogue. This is what you would see if you were walking with me and had a camera. Cohen and the others in his group were shown model farms and showcase factories, traditional Beijing opera, Shanghai cleansed of its former decadence. They were also granted an audience with Premier Zhou Enlai. But NBC's approach left Cohen disappointed. What they showed on those shows were, was the, the story as NBC saw it, and that story was American use to five travel ban. It was not what is going on in China. In the lives, uh, industry, and military, every, everything was going on in China was not being shown to the people of the United States. After returning to the United States, Cohen was questioned by the FBI and harassed by the government. My passport expired and uh, I applied for renewal. And I went, you know, sent it in with the, and they, it was, renewal was refused. It took a court case for Cohen to get his passport back. By the late 1950s, China entered a period of upheaval. First, the Great Leap Forward, Chairman Mao's push to transform China almost overnight into a modern economy, but which led instead to economic collapse and a disastrous famine. Then, in the mid-1960s, the Cultural Revolution. From listening posts like Hong Kong, a new generation of China watchers struggled to make sense of what was going on. Bernard Kalb covered Asia for the New York Times and CBS News in the 50s and 60s. Chasing China is what we did. That was the obsession that we reporters had who lived in Hong Kong or throughout Southeast Asia. How do we get information about China? We got bits and pieces. We read everything we could. We put the mosaic of pieces together and tried to extract some narrative about what was happening in China. But this was bits and pieces journalism. Stanley Carno arrived in the British colony for Time magazine. What I do remember vividly arriving in Hong Kong in May of 1959 uh, with my wife and getting off the plane at Kai Tak Airport and, you know, immediately become thrilled and absorbed by the whole sort of smells and sights and so forth of Hong Kong. Populated largely by refugees from Mao's revolution, described by some as a capitalist parasite on the skin of communist China, Hong Kong seethed with energy and intrigue. Richard Solomon was then a young American diplomat. Hong Kong was a hot pot of foreign service people from many governments, uh, journalist community, and academics. And basically we were doing all the same sort of thing, uh, that is, trying to figure out what was going on into China. Robert Elegant, a Chinese speaker who started with Newsweek and eventually moved to the Los Angeles Times, was among the more knowledgeable reporters. Scholars, diplomats, spooks of various sort and so on. and. Uh, Everybody knew who every, everybody knew who everybody was. This was as close as reporters could get to the mainland, a hill overlooking the Chinese border. Here, they could peer across at rice paddies and villages, so near, but completely out of reach. American journalists tried every conceivable approach to get visas to China without success. How to get a visa to China, that was our obsession. In an interview in 1960, the AP's Hong Kong bureau chief, Forrest Edwards, expressed his frustration. Like all American newspaper men in Hong Kong, yes, uh, 
We've all tried to get in, and uh, none of us have made it so far. In my case, I made my first application when I was transferred to Hong Kong uh, about two and a half years ago. You put in your application for a visa. I put it in several times. I've had uh, no response whatsoever. I was a young, barely literate New York Times reporter then, and I wanted to get as close to China as I could. The China I could chase was the Chinese ambassador to Indonesia, Wang Chen. He was a survivor of the long march in China. He was a historic figure, a retired general who had gone into diplomacy. And I would always try to see Ambassador Wang Chen in Indonesia at diplomatic functions sponsored by President Sukarno at other events. I would sidle up to Wang Chen and he would just as quickly sidle away from me. Uh, to say he was practicing for the Olympics would be to understate the spurt he took. Barred from the country they were covering, the China watchers looked for other sources of information. One resource, the government-controlled Chinese media. We had a big house. It was full of little men, or big men, some of them, with radio sets, scribbling handwritten Chinese from the local broadcast so that I'd walk into my office in the morning and I'd find a stack this high of handwritten Chinese. Well, obviously, I wasn't going to get through the whole thing, but I got through enough of it to understand. Robert Keatley arrived in 1964 for the Wall Street Journal. Reading the People's Daily could drive you crazy because you kept trying to figure out, you know, where's the phrase that means something in all this drivel? The reports coming out of Peking during all those years were stiff with sort of a verbiage and, you know, gobbledygook. But if you read it carefully, between the lines you discovered something important was happening in China. Some man was uh, mentioned in third place instead of second place. He'd been demoted or put, executed or whatever. It was that sort of thing. It was a kind of a detective work. Henry Bradshaw was based in Hong Kong for the now defunct Washington Star. A serious job of China watching, trying to understand what was going on, required going through that material every day or seeing what not only what was being said, but what was not being said. Many of the reporters came to rely on Father Laszlo Ladani, a Jesuit priest who'd lived in China in the 1940s and then moved to Hong Kong. The American correspondents in Hong Kong, for most part, didn't speak Chinese. They relied on Father Laszlo Ladani, the Hungarian priest. He was the expert. Nicholas Platt was a U.S. diplomat in Hong Kong in the 60s. I think Ladani was the, the, the doyen of the China Watchers, and he was vastly respected. And his, you know, he put out a little publication every week, which matched in intensity and depth the analysis of staffs that were 10, 15 times the size. And I remember calling on him in his office, which was a, a little bit bigger than this. And he had, you know, you'd pull a drawer out and there would be a, a, a tape recorder attached to a radio, to a radio. He had all of his different radio stations um, all organized and he was very systematic. Father Ladani's great skill was his ability to read between the lines of Chinese propaganda. Father Ladani, who was a great, great China watcher, a very good friend, used to say, you have to understand, if they say a bumper harvest, that means they almost met their target. If they said it was a satisfactory harvest, it means they only got halfway to their target. Another key source was the continuing flow of refugees from China. Ted Koppel was ABC's Hong Kong correspondent in the late 60s. The most accurate information that they were getting out of China tended to come from the waves of refugees who came out. And of course, that began in the, in the late 40s and went on into uh, the 50s and even into the 60s. This is a report from Hong Kong by ABC's John Daly in 1960. The escapees know the penalty if they are caught by the Reds, imprisonment or death. But still they come, running the Red gunboat blockade to freedom. They find a haven in Hong Kong's tightly packed floating villages of sampans and junks. Conditions are crowded in these coves and bays, but it is a home. I used to go to Macau. In Macau, you had uh, hospices run by uh, um, religious groups, and they would pick up refugees and take care of them, and they would let me interview the refugees. 
And I got a lot of good stories. Relying on refugees, however, had its drawbacks. That was not a, a main source. I mean, it was good for anecdote and, and quote and something, if it fit into something that really seemed to be going on. They could kind of describe what they saw around them, and that was very useful. But this was not a source of policy, uh, 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 explanation of policy. As a correspondent for Time magazine, Stanley Carnot had to contend with his boss, Time's publisher, Henry Luce, an ardent anti-communist and supporter of Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang now ruled the island of Taiwan, while continuing to declare his intention to retake the communist-controlled mainland. Soon after Carnot began his Hong Kong assignment, he accompanied Luce to meet Chiang Kai-shek in Taipei. Chiang Kai-shek is his great hero. He put Chiang Kai-shek on the cover of Time magazine numbers of times with Madame Zhang and so forth. We go there to Taiwan. We have an, we have an appointment to, uh, to have dinner with Chiang Kai-shek the night we arrive. We go to the Grand Hotel, and the baggage has not arrived at the hotel. The reason, of course, is we flew in and we, well, we got off the airplane in Taipei, some handlers came and took, a, took us in a limo and took us to the hotel and we didn't know where the baggage was. So here's Luce and he's fretting and pacing around, very nervous. Uh, he says to me, do you think they lost the baggage? To which I said, well, they lost the mainland, didn't they? In the early 1960s, the pro-Taiwan lobby was still powerful in Washington. Henry Luce was a leading member. And then after the dinner, we would have to go to a little side table, and there Madame, Madame Zhang would come. And here she was, all dressed up in her fancy chunk sum, with her jade necklace and so forth. And uh, she spoke, you know, with a kind of southern drawl, you know, because she'd gone to a college in Georgia, Wesleyan College, you know, before she went to Wellesley. And she would nag Willows, you know, and there would be that kind of conversation where she'd say, Harry, we got to do something about the commies in Washington, that sort of stuff. Soon after, Carno left time to become the Hong Kong correspondent for the Washington Post. The U.S. consulate in Hong Kong had emerged as a crucial center of China watching in the territory. By now, Seymour Topping was there for the New York Times. The American consulate there. Uh, which is, uh, you know, is, uh, was a larger uh, mission than uh, uh, most uh, uh, American embassies uh, 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 abroad. They were interviewing refugees. They had managed to arrange for the smuggling out of provincial newspapers. There were agents that were operating in, in China. There were people who were counting all the pigs who imported into Hong Kong and people who took photographs of railroad car serial numbers and a variety of other things. There was also satellite imagery of, of harvests and stuff like that. Now, I as a correspondent uh, had to a large extent access to that information. The daily routine for reporters was like trying to find pieces in a jigsaw puzzle. Gerald Schechter arrived in Hong Kong in 1960 for Time magazine. You'd read in to start out, and then you'd go to the consulate, talk to talk to your buddies there, um, talk to foreign diplomats. Uh, the French were pretty good, the British were good, and um, and and then you try to get a a peg. Uh, a couple of refugees who'd come over uh, that you could maybe send one of the boys in the office who spoke to interview and, and put, all, put all that together. There were often sharp differences of opinion among the journalists and the diplomats about what was happening. The United States Consulate General in Hong Kong had differing views about what was uh, going on in China. And some of the officials were feeding the press their particular perspectives on what was going on in China. Someone like Stanley Carno would publish an article in the Washington Post, let's say, that would uh, make one particular point or interpretation about what was going on in China. It would be read by senior State Department officials who would then say, hey, what's going on? Or we hadn't seen this particular point of view. So that 
the, our press, our media people became a vehicle in part for this internal debate within the, China, within the American government about what was in fact happening in China. One of Carnot's best sources was CIA officer James Lilly, who in 1989 became the U.S. ambassador to China. One time Jim Lilly calls me on the telephone. He says, listen, I got a story for you. And he tells me something over the phone. He's on Garden Road and I'm on Kennedy Terrace. We're only about five steps away from each other. So he tells me something on the telephone. Obviously, he's trying to plant something with me. This is the attitude of the CIA guys. Now I'm working for the Washington Post. The president of the United States is going to pick up the Washington Post and read it at breakfast. If he sends it back through channels, it's like putting a message in a bottle and throwing it into the sea. If he leaks it to a reporter, the president's going to read it at breakfast the next morning. Okay. Now, the reporter has got to be very careful. He doesn't want to end up being a conduit for the CIA guy. But on the other hand, he knows that the CIA guy has got a lot of information that's very valuable. So what happens is over time, you develop a relationship with the CIA guy in Hong Kong or wherever you are. The correspondents, diplomats, and spooks lived and breathed China. I had a little group known, known to my wife as a little boys club. We met every month. There were people from a consulate, various consulates, various news organizations, and various intelligence organizations. And, you know, you kick things around and you compared notes and you put it together. I knew them all. I mean, Elegant was very elegant and very grand in his presentation. Carno was totally cozy, funny, made his points by asking questions. Bob Keatley was always very bland. His sort of bland appearance belied a very keen analytical mind, and, and, uh, and he always had something smart, some con smart conclusion to draw. Um, they were all friends. We did things together. We were all part of like a family, sort of a China-watching family. The wives knew each other, the kids knew each other. Uh, you know, you went to the beach with everybody, you had dinners with everybody. My wife would go crazy. Can't you guys talk about something else besides China? The Great Leap Forward, which Mao had launched in 1958 in a wildly unrealistic drive to turn China into a modern industrialized country in just five years, had been a disaster. Mao knew nothing about economics, but they started to spread, thought by th sheer enthusiasm that they could ra raise China up and into the upper reaches of, uh, of uh, capitalism, as it were. And uh, it failed. It failed miserably. And uh, in 1960, uh, countless millions of people died of starvation. 61, it began in 59, right. 61. One of the worst famines was cannibalism. Well, we have the bodies floating in to Hong Kong after the Great Leap Forward. But details still remain sketchy. The Chinese government, of course, said nothing. And at the time, reporters didn't really understand the enormous scale of the catastrophe. China has had a reasonably successful 1959 uh, steel production uh, is up if we can believe their own statistics at that time the london times legendary asia correspondent richard hughes was even more emphatic we used to talk in the old days of there being famines in which millions of chinese died now at least whatever terrible tyrannies are happening inside china at least nobody is dying on that large scale of hunger or of hardship I think if you look at the coverage, um, looking back on it, you know, we, 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 the numbers were so enormous, uh, but we never had a, we never had a grip on that. We knew we knew it was a, a bad famine, in quotes, but um, it was it was it was hard to get quantitative, reliable information. We were saying there was a famine. But we, we didn't know the extent of it, and, the, and it was not possible to get a fir, first-hand reporting. So um, it, it came, it, I think what came out was a pale shadow of what was really happening. In the early 60s, following the failure of the Great Leap, Chairman Mao had stepped back from active rule and allowed more pragmatic leaders, Liu Xiaoqi, Zhou Enlai, and Deng Xiaoping, to guide China towards a modest recovery. 
In 1964, the Chinese gave a visa to Edgar Snow, the American journalist whose interviews with Mao in 1936 and book Red Star Over China first brought the communist leader to international attention. This was Snow's second visit since 1949. He had also spent five months in China in 1960, where his positive portrayal brought him criticism in the West for underplaying the impact of the famine caused by the Great Leap Forward. People look back and say, ah, he didn't know that all these people died. Actually, one of the things that's so interesting is that even as difficult as it was, even though nobody told him there was a problem, he'd ask people, he'd say, I hear our people dying. They'd say, no, no one's dying. People who were old friends of his, who some of them didn't know, but if they did know, weren't telling him. It was not easy to enter the People's Republic. In 1964, and again in 1965, Snow was allowed to spend several months in China. As the only American journalist permitted to visit, he was given unusual access and interviews with Premier Zhou Enlai and Chairman Mao. They knew him and they trusted him and they thought he would do a fair job of reporting on them, just as he had in the 1930s. The leadership in China saw him as the kind of person they wanted. If they were going to have an American come in and write about them, Snow was the obvious one to do it. But even Snow had limits on what the Chinese would let him see. He didn't have the, the freedom. He couldn't just go any place he wanted to go. China had become a highly organized society and he just couldn't trail off by himself. Snow hoped that his sympathetic reporting would offer Americans a fuller picture of China. To judge their living conditions today, we need to see something of the past when it was really tough. But he also realized that if he were to say just negative things, and he did say some negative things, in fact people don't remember he could be negative in, in what he wrote, but if he dwelt on those things, then he was merely fueling the fires of people who didn't want any relations with the Chinese communists. In fact, Zhou Enlai told Snow Beijing was still open to better relations with Washington. In order to improve Sino-American relations, we must start with matters of principle. The agreement should be reached between China and the United States on peaceful coexistence. Although Snow produced a book and a documentary film, in the Cold War atmosphere of the mid-1960s, he had trouble finding outlets for his material in the United States. His reports had little impact. Soon after Snow left China, reporters in Hong Kong detected signs that something big was beginning to happen across the border. By late 1965, Chairman Mao and his radical allies, including his wife Zhang Qing, were preparing for the Cultural Revolution, aiming to topple the pragmatists and revive China's revolutionary spirit. Mao, by 65, when it began, uh, felt that he was being betrayed by his closest associates. And he started a movement which sought to destroy the government, of the, the People's Government of China, sought to destroy the Communist Party of China, both of which were Mao's creations. He was turning on his own creations. Um, and that's how it began, and it got worse and worse. There's an article appeared in the Shanghai Liberation Daily, fiercely criticizing the opera Hai Rei resigns from office. Legendary story about official who criticized the emperor and resigned from office. And all of the old Chinese translators, they said immediately, this is something big. And uh, we have to watch this very, very carefully. And it turned out to be something that Madame Mao and her people were aiming at, um, ultimately, the, the Beijing Provincial Be Beijing Party Committee. It was the opening shot. About a man called, here comes a Chinese name, called Hai Rui, who was known as the upright Mandarin, which is also a clue. There weren't many upright Mandarins. C corruption was institutionalized under the Confucian system as it is now. And it was a, it, somehow that thing began to ring bells. It was very odd, the reaction to this. And, we saw that something very big was coming. Soon, Mao mobilized his chief weapon, the youthful Red Guards. So here's the Cultural Revolution. It starts off, and uh, the Red Guard papers start coming in. The consulate is translating the Red Guard papers, giving me copies of the translations. And the classified stuff was very good. A lot of the classified stuff was translations of, uh, of the... Uh, the Red Guard Papers. 
In scouring the Chinese media, the clues came from many places. I put t Seymour Topping onto a story about, um, about the great Beijing, um, Beijing Opera Festival on uh, socialist subjects in which the piece de resistance was a, a one-act opera called The Bucket, in which the good guys and the bad guys were struggling over are the good guys being the women in the family and the bad guys being the man, struggling over uh, a bucket full of night soil and trying to figure out whether it should be put on the private plot or be put, put on the collective. And this was considered was hilarious, although it was absolutely dead serious, and, and it was um, something that Madame Mao felt personally very strongly about. With the Red Guards exhorted by Mao to destroy all old habits, customs, and ideas, there were other signs. Suddenly, a little later, a great flood of antiques came into Hong Kong. The Red Guards, uh, the, who the youth so-called, were actually supposed to be destroy the four olds. These were public slogans, destroy the four olds, the old civilization is bad, we must destroy the old civilization and on its rubble build a new civilization. These were all public and the kids were doing this but a lot of them were taking the, the little bits of the old civilization they thought were saleable and smuggling them out to Hong Kong where they were on sale. So you know, you, this is another example of strange ways that one learned what was really happening. As throngs of Red Guards paid homage to Mao in Beijing's Tiananmen Square, turmoil spread across the country. There were things that were happening that couldn't happen if, there were, if Mao had not lost control. There were battles between the so-called Red Guards, who were his so-called protégés, and people I called Red Sentinels. There were actually battles going on. Sitting in Hong Kong, the reporters tried to piece together details of the factional fighting. The translations of provincial papers and Red Guard uh, <clears throat> papers and manifestos and you know, lengthy descriptions of you know, Group X attacking Group Y, etc. You know, who knows how true they were? I did radio pieces in which I, I talked about the madness of the Cultural Revolution based on what I had heard and what I saw. But if you ask me, could I prove what I wrote? No, no I can only say it, it appears that. And that's apparently what we were saying, it appears that. Or according to informed sources being the people in the embassy and the consul general. In a famous documentary in the mid-60s called China, The Roots of Madness, Theodore White spelled out the frustrations of the China watchers. At the American consulate in Hong Kong, there are cascades, mountains, piles of translations that come in from the Chinese. And these are sandy, gritty, gravelly little bits of information that are meaningless because we don't know who does what to who in Peking. We don't know how they think or how they make up their mind because no matter how hard we study China, we cannot predict such a thing as the Great Leap Forward in 1958. We can't predict such a thing as the Red Guard purge of 1966, it's as if there were a struggle of sea monsters going on deep, deep beneath the surface of our vision. And only these bubbles come to the surface to tell us that these are terrible struggles, but we don't know what they're struggling about. Our attitudes during the 60s had been shaped by all the reporting about the Cultural Revolution and the turmoil, the Red Guard rampages. And there was a movie uh, that Theodore White had produced called China, The Roots of Madness. And uh, the basic point that he made was that uh, this internal political struggle represented a kind of insanity or political madness on the part of the Chinese. With Americans barred from China, Audrey Topping, the Canadian wife of New York Times Hong Kong correspondent Seymour Topping, somehow managed to get a tourist visa in the summer of 1966. A photographer, she arrived to find Beijing in chaos. The Red Guards were all around, and opposite was the um, International Club. Mm -hmm. And I was standing on the fence taking pictures, and when I came down, the um, one Chinese student said, 
I want your camera. And so this started coming towards me. And I said, you're not getting my camera. <laughs> and I started looking around and trying to be nice. And then um, across the street, I heard a voice saying, Audrey, Audrey. I turned, and there was Jacques Guillemot on the steps of the International Club. He was a French military attaché, and he said, run, run. And the students parted. He told me that this was a, a serious demonstration, uh, hostile students, everybody is, uh, uh, we don't really, he didn't really know what's going on, but his read was get me out of there as soon as possible. And, and he got me tickets on the train. We get to Canton. And I think, uh-oh, they're going to get my, all my film. So they didn't, they just said, go, go. I got all my pictures and I did a, it was a cover story for the Times, yeah. For American TV reporters in Hong Kong, covering the upheaval was virtually impossible. Hong Kong is accustomed to this kind of propaganda from Red China. We resorted to uh, extraordinary means to get pictures. We would drive once a week out, out to the, uh, the border in the new territories. We would set up a large antenna. Uh, we would put a television camera, I mean a film camera, and shoot the, the output of a black and white television set which was hooked to the automobile battery uh, and we would pick up with the help of the uh, with the help of that big antenna we'd pick up Guangdong television and every once in a while you got some pretty good stuff. With so little information rumors ran wild. Every once in a while I would get a phone call at three in the morning uh, which of course was two in the afternoon back in New York, and some idiot on the desk had just seen a wire story quoting a Hong Kong newspaper, and there were some real crap papers. And these would always be the real crap papers which had reported that Mao had died. Uh, so the, uh, the call would come saying, we have a wire service report that Mao is dead. And I'd say, it's 3 o'clock in the morning here. What do you think I'm going to do about that? Well, I don't know, but, you know, see if you can confirm it. By the summer of 1967, the violence unleashed by the Cultural Revolution had led to virtual civil war. In the midst of it, Canadian Morley Safer, a correspondent for CBS News, pretended to be an amateur archaeologist and, like Audrey Topping the year before, got a Chinese tourist visa along with a British CBS cameraman who said he was a travel agent. 700 million minds are being replaced by this red book, The Thoughts of Chairman Mao Zedong. Chairman Mao is our great leader. So off we went and uh, spent the uh, best part of a month uh, during the Cultural Revolution, and it was quite honestly uh, uh, like Alice falling down the rabbit hole. and It was a just another world that we uh, inhabited for those four weeks. I would like to uh, to read a passage of Chairman Mao's quotation. So when we got off the plane, we uh, were handed uh, the red book, of, you know, the thoughts of Mao Zedong, and uh, we stood in the airport reception area, uh, reciting uh, the first uh, the first couple of quotations together with this gentleman from the Tourist Bureau and a couple of his acolytes. Uh, and then we got on a minibus and were taken to a hotel. Safer found a country consumed by worship of Chairman Mao. They sing, the ship cannot sail without a helmsman. We rely on the thought of Chairman Mao. Despite the camera, the Chinese apparently did not realize that Safer and his colleague were journalists. Johnny Peters, the cameraman, uh, had a 16 millimeter camera uh, that was uh, converted to look like an eight millimeter tourist camera, you know, the sort of camera that any tourist back in those days of film would have. Uh, and it was also rigged for sound, so we uh, 
I was able to do one or two stand-ups as well while we were there when no one was looking, which was very difficult because there was, were always people looking. It didn't take long for Safer to get into trouble. Visiting an agricultural museum, he observed that not all the farm machinery had been made in China, as the Red Guards were telling him. Well, one of them overheard me. I was grabbed. I was arrested um, for insulting the people's machinery. Literally, that was the charge. We were both um, grabbed and uh, frog-marched out of the museum taken to a hotel lobby that, where a uh, makeshift court was set up with a very, very angry young woman as judge sitting behind this desk. And uh, she spoke English, actually. And uh, she read the charge of insulting the people's ingenuity and the machinery. And I, uh, I said, well, let me explain. And every time I said, let me explain, she, she said, shut up. And our guide, the man who met us at the airport, who was a lovely man, whispered in my ear, he said, don't explain anything, just apologize. Just apologize. And so she asked me, some question again, and I said, I wish to apologize. And she said, let me hear your apology. And I said, <laughs> winging it as I went, that uh, <clears throat> as a victim of Western propaganda of the, in the United States and their running dogs, I, uh, I have been led to believe that, uh, that the uh, 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 Chinese people were not up to this, that, or the other. And of course, my experience in China has just shown me the truth, and I want to apologize for this mistakes, is, these mistakes as is a result of a bad education. Whereupon this angry young woman beamed like a Cheshire cat, and she said, that was beautiful. <laughs> and uh, the, the court broke up. Tea was brought out and everyone laughed and we had a good time and we were off we went. Safer's documentary was virtually the only first-hand report on the Cultural Revolution to air on American television. CBS executives made no effort to control how he presented China, but even Safer couldn't avoid some of the political sensitivities of the time. We decided to call his CBS reports Morley Safer's China Diary. And uh, <clears throat> the day we were taping the, the studio parts of it, which was the day of the broadcast, Richard Salant, who was the then president of CBS News, terrific guy, decent man, great believer in the First Amendment, Dick said, we're going to change the title. And I said, why? What, what's up? What are, you, what are we calling it? He said, you've got to call it Morley Safer's Red China Diary. <laughs> and, they, and clearly, uh, Dick had been told, perhaps, I don't know, or just uh, fearful himself that if we did not call it Red China, we would be accused of being soft on, on uh, Communist China. Uh, so it was called Morley Safer's Red China Diary. Meanwhile, that same summer, in Hong Kong, pro-Beijing leftists, inspired by the Cultural Revolution, staged a series of violent demonstrations against British colonial rule. Marvin Farkas, an American freelance cameraman, found himself in the thick of the action. At that time, leftists they would go around every day and they would march on the streets. They would march on Government House, up that garden road. They would march on it and they would cover the fences outside with, with uh, derogatory things about the British. They would hang the governor in effigy and burn British flags, things like that. People were wondering, would the police department hold, you know, and they did. They were ripping off Mao badges and stepping on them, ripping up those little red books. And it seems for some reason, all of these left, they all had eyeglasses. There were broken eyeglasses all over the street and blood and they, they were sitting there and of course they had bandages already. They're 
wrapping bandages around the head and looking so forlorn, you know, it was, pictures were fantastic. As the Cultural Revolution continued, tensions between China and the Soviet Union, which Mao viewed as revisionist, having abandoned its revolutionary fervor, intensified. This became very open, very hostile, uh, shouting at each other, really. Uh, the Chinese publishing uh, their version of what Marxism really said in this case, the, the Soviets sort of rocked back on their heels really by a Chinese logic and uh, trying to defend their position. And things went steadily downhill. In 1969, armed clashes erupted along the Sino-Soviet border. For once, the Chinese made no attempt to hide what was going on. These are the Hong Kong offices of Xinhua, the new China news agency. It is here that the Chinese version of the Sino-Soviet border dispute is passed out to the Western world. When the Chinese were fighting the, uh, uh, the Soviets along the, uh, the uh, Usuri River, uh, we would get combat footage that was coming off Chinese television, and then it was possible actually to do a story with a video, which was a change for us. The Sino-Soviet split was one of the catalysts in Richard Nixon's evolving view of China, one the former vice president, now out of office, had begun to spell out in private meetings with journalists. Morley Safer had lunch with Nixon in Hong Kong. It was uh, just an off-the-record uh, lunch with, uh, with Nixon, uh, who was then sort of uh, homeless in a certain way politically. Um, and we were talking to him about ch uh, China, rather, sorry, we were talking to him about uh, Vietnam and the war, and, and Nixon just waved aside, he said, forget Vietnam, Vietnam is a sideshow. So the important player here is Asia, is China, and the most important thing we can do is recognize China. And the only person who will be able to achieve that is going to be a Republican president. So it was clearly on Nixon's mind long before he became a candidate. Nixon also sought out Robert Elegant. He wanted to know what the Chinese were like. He was told I knew about China, and he called me. Naturally, I went to see him. I was curious. I was on the Mandarin Hotel, and I had a driver for, with a Volkswagen. And I told Wang, you know, come back in an hour. It was four hours. And I was very impressed, but Nixon was asking questions. I was talking most of the time that this was a very penetrating mind. The Sino-Soviet dispute and China's domestic weakness, even if self-inflicted, also led Mao to rethink his long-standing hostility to the U.S. In 1970, he invited Edgar Snow to join him in Tiananmen Square for Chinese National Day, and in an interview, Mao told Snow Nixon would be welcome to visit China. Yao Wei was a young Chinese foreign ministry official who worked on the Snow visit. The leadership took seriously about that interview, and uh, they wanted every word to be exact. And Ed was supposed to uh, uh, give it to the magazine and newspaper uh, intact. Nothing should be changed. Uh, I was a little curious, you know, why you know, all the fuss, you know? And, and that, that was the interview that when Mao said, uh, welcome, welcoming Nixon to come, even as a tourist. But the Nixon administration missed the signal. Winston Lord was then a young aide to Nixon's national security advisor, Henry Kissinger. This was a very significant interview, and either lower-level people in the government were aware of it and did not understand its significance and pass it up to the policymakers, or it was missed completely. We're still not quite sure why the White House was never really aware of this interview. Uh, but it's, there's no question that Mao never did things casually, was sending signals it took the visit of the U.S. ping-pong team in April 1971 for Beijing's intentions to become clearer. Soon after came invitations for Seymour Topping, Robert Keatley, and the publisher of the Long Island newspaper Newsday to visit China. The reporters were invited to dinner by Zhou Enlai, who used the occasion to signal a more flexible attitude on the contentious issue of Taiwan. He, for the first time, delineated 
the policy of peaceful attraction of, of Taiwan, which still holds uh, today. In other words, there was not an intention with uh, military confrontation or invasion to take over Taiwan. The whole point of it was just a minor symbol that there was something happening on the China-U.S. front. In June, following a secret trip to Beijing by Nixon's national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, the president announced plans to visit China. That fall, China was admitted to the United Nations, and Chiang Kai-shek's rival government in Taiwan was expelled. The move triggered a mad press scramble to talk to the Chinese diplomats coming to New York to take up the UN seat. The trick was how to get to the Chinese delegation visiting the United States to go to the UN and be accepted in the UN. And I went up to New York and said, look, this is what I used to do when I lived in Asia. I would try to get on the same plane with foreign ministers or other officials and try to interview them on the plane when I could in no other way achieve any access to them. So what do you say we do this, CBS News? What do you say we do this? Tonight, Walter Cronkite, Gordon Manning, vice president of CBS News, and I, and pick up a cameraman in Paris, go to Paris and try to find a way to be on the same plane with the Chinese delegation that has just left Beijing en route to the UN with a stop in Paris. We were able to dope out the fact when the, the delegation would be leaving on which flight. We all, CBS bought us all first class tickets. 30 minutes after takeoff, I strolled down the aisle did a small U-turn, and I looked down, and I said, Mr. Foreign Minister, Mr. Ambassador, what a surprise to meet you here. And so when we got off the plane, CBS developed the film immediately, and CBS had this big exclusive at that particular point. The main point, their extreme amiability in a situation where they might have been less than friendly. We had, after all, caught them unaware by being aboard with our cameras. In China, however, Chairman Mao's decision to welcome Richard Nixon had generated sharp opposition, in particular from his designated heir, General Lin Biao. In September 1971, China watchers in Hong Kong detected clues that something serious was happening in the top leadership. There was a big reception down in Hanoi for a visiting Chinese delegation. Um, and at that reception, uh, I guess it was around early 2021 or so, September. Uh, at that reception, the usual toasts were to uh, Chairman Mao Zedong and his loyal deputy, Marshal Lin Biao. That was standard. About three days later, there was another reception in Hanoi for some other Chinese delegation. And at that reception, the toasts were to Chairman Mao Zedong, period. Well. Boy, did I jump on this hard. Lin had suddenly been dropped from the leadership. It was very obvious, and I wrote that one really hard. Soon came reports that Lin Biao had died in a plane crash after allegedly trying to overthrow Mao. Richard Solomon was by now an aide to Henry Kissinger. One of the most informed reporters was, uh, was uh, Stanley Carno. You know, and he had his contacts uh, in the intelligence community and in the diplomatic corps, and so he was getting enough information to be writing something that was fairly accurate about the internal leadership struggles. When I wrote my story about Lin Biao, for example, in the Post, the Nixon administration, was they went berserk. They thought that anything that was going to come out that the Chinese didn't like would, might cancel the trip. Nixon and Kissinger really wanted to limit press coverage of China beyond official communication. What they were concerned about was that if negative stories appeared in the press about instability in China, then you would get questioning of, uh, you know, how can we have this uh, opening to China if they're tearing themselves apart with their internal conflicts? Um, Henry was not happy when the Lin Biao business broke out. But for most American reporters and their audiences, the internal politics in Beijing were much less important than the fact that with the Nixon visit, a country that had been almost inaccessible for more than two decades appeared ready to open its doors. Mao主席,您是当代无产阶级最杰出的领袖,最伟大的天才。
，您和革命群众永远心连心，您是我们心中永远不落的红太阳